Well, good day, and welcome to Hearts Connection, worship from Bridge Street United Church, this time for the week beginning Sunday, June the 27th, 2021. It's good to have you along. Thanks for choosing to spend part of your day with us. Our opening hymn, Birds Are Singing. As we worship together today, we light a candle. It's a reminder that Christ is with us and among us, present in our world and in our lives. Good morning. The reading this morning is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came and when he saw him, fell at his feet. My little daughter is at the point of death, he begged repeatedly. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up to him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of the disease. Immediately aware that power had gone from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing that what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. 
While he was speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said, Talitha come, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Thanks be to God. If opportunity allowed you to join with us for worship two weeks ago, you would have seen this image. Featuring it then was my subtle way of acknowledging that June is Pride Month in Canada, a time when our country's consciousness, at least in a passing way, one would hope for a more intentional one, is tuned to the well-being of the LGBTQ2S plus community. For those unfamiliar with the acronym, it stands for Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, Transgendered, Queer or Questioning, Two-Spirited, and Others. About the same time as I was constructing that June 13th worship service, a request came to me from a few folk in our congregation to fly a rainbow flag on the outside of the church building as a signal of solidarity. While I'm wholeheartedly in favor of this or indeed any demonstration of allyship, I was disinclined to concur with the request because it occurred to me that our faith community hasn't yet availed itself of the opportunity to consider really consider what it would mean for us to fly that rainbow flag and what it would say to those beyond our number, especially LGBTQ2S plus folk, who claim those colored stripes as both identifier, proclaimer, and rallying call. To our good fortune, a lot of time and talent has been contributed by a host of United Church people across our country with the aim of helping congregations find congruency between their words and their actions, especially when their front lawn signs proclaim, all are welcome. Alas, for people different than the dominant culture, particularly sexual and gender minorities, lived experience often demonstrates that they are, in fact, not welcomed in churches, mosques, synagogues, temples, and other sacred gathering places. That is, unless and until they suppress who they are and how they express themselves. In my mind's eye, that is a shame. Coordinating the National United Church's support for LGBTQ2S plus people is an entity named Affirm United. With oversight of both educational opportunities and process requirements to become, quote, an affirming congregation, end quote, Affirm United is all about inclusivity writ large. Notwithstanding that their initial efforts were focused on finding ways to make the United Church more open and accepting of LGBTQ2S plus folk, Affirm United's agenda has since become much more expansive and now includes a focus on placemaking for people with different ethnicities, physical abilities, financial capacity, and so forth. With all this in mind, I can't help but wonder what it would look like for Bridge Street Church to go through the affirming process. I wonder what we might find out about ourselves, about others. And with that knowledge, I wonder how might BSUC reach those folks who have felt abandoned by the Christian Church, and perhaps still do. I'd like to know your thoughts. I really would. 
Now, it occurs to me that you may be asking yourself why I've directed our consideration towards the matter of opening the church to those whose life circumstances may be notably different than our own. The answer to that comes from three influences. Influence number one. In our reading of today's gospel passage, I found it truly heartwarming to see that Jesus wanted the hemorrhaging woman to come out from the shadow of her isolation, self-loathing, shame, anonymity, and into the light of acceptance, health, and rightful place, not as someone in any way defective, but complete, fully complete in all of her being. The teachable future here, the teachable feature here, integrity, authenticity, and fearless living are among Jesus' top priorities. Influence number two. Last Saturday morning, I took a phone call from a gentleman who's keen to connect with a church in post-pandemic times. The only provisio is that he's a proud and openly living gay man. His concern was whether Bridge Street Church would be a safe place for him and his husband. I said I thought it would. But you know, I shouldn't have had to guess about that. As for the third and final influencer, this past Monday, I read an opinion piece in the Toronto Star by someone who, in my knowing of them 20 years earlier, was a persistent and vocal detractor of gays and lesbians. Now an Anglican cleric with a radically different heart for those he formerly critiqued and criticized. The Reverend Michael Corin penned what follows. As you listen to his words, please do give serious thought to whether it's time for Bridge Street Church to enter into the affirming process with the goal of testing our readiness and willingness to become a spiritual ally of the LGBTQ2S plus community, among others. What Would Jesus Do During Pride? By Michael Corrin. Not so long ago, the letters WWJD seemed to be emblazoned everywhere. On the back of cars, at sport events, uh, on flags and t-shirts. They stood for, what would Jesus do? Not really my style, but during Pride Month, it's worth asking the question. What would Jesus Christ do? Simple. He'd wave the rainbow flag and march in the parade. I say this as a 62-year-old straight married ordained Christian cleric and one until around eight years ago opposed equal marriage and was considered an opponent of the LGBTQ community. But people change, thank God. Literally in my case, thank God. If we study it, the theology is entirely clear, which may surprise some people. Jesus doesn't refer to what we now define as homosexuality, a word not coined until the 19th century. And lesbianism is never mentioned in the Old Testament. When St. Paul writes on the topic, he condemns straight men using boys for sex, usually in pagan initiation rituals, and not people of the same gender having loving relationships. As for the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, it wasn't linked to homosexuality until the medieval period. If you doubt me, read the Bible. Ezekiel. This was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food, and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. They were haughty and did abominable things before me. Therefore, I remove them when I saw it. Those few prohibitions that do exist in the Hebrew scriptures are part of an ancient guide for an ancient people, and also restrict certain combinations of cloth and eating of various foods, all considered irrelevant in modern Christianity. They also, by the way, justify selling one's children into bondage 
if you're to take the Bible seriously, which I most certainly do, we can't always take it literally. God is too clever for that. There is one story in the Gospels, however, that might be relevant. Jesus is approached by a centurion. The Roman explains that his slave, whom he loves dearly, is dying. Would Jesus heal him? He does so and praises the man's devotion. Based on the specific Greek words used and the mocking attitude first century Jews had towards their oppressors regarding their sexuality, it's highly likely that those who witnessed this and those who read about it in the early church would have assumed that the two men were in a same-sex relationship. Isn't it interesting what happens when we understand the context and history of Scripture and read it without preconception and prejudice? But there's more to it, more to why Jesus would be with those celebrating pride and not those opposing and protesting. He stood with the oppressed, the rejected, and the marginalized. He criticized the legalists, the judgmental, and the pendants who twisted holiness into hatred. He preached a shining new message of love, justice, tolerance, and change. That's the euphoric quintessence of that Jesus song, the melody of the Gospels. The time will come, you know, when organized Christianity will look back to its homophobia with shame, just as it looks to racism as a filthy stain and sometimes an open wound. Many churches have already moved on, apologized, and now work to repair the damage they caused. But tragically, not enough of them. It matters because so many people have suffered for too long and still face horrendous persecution and violence in large parts of the world. This outrageous obsession shames Christianity. We as Christians can't speak of revolutionary love if we embrace reactionary bigotry. And even now there are many in the church, some of them with political influence even in Canada, who believe that can, people can be, quote, converted, end quote, from who and what they are, as if there is something wrong and bad about them. God forgive such malice. WWJD, what would Jesus do? He'd remind us that we're supposed to work to become more like him, not try to make him more like us. He'd say it's not who we love, but that we love that matters, and that authentic faith is about acceptance, not exclusion. Pride should remind Christians of that. If we're willing to look, listen, and learn.
with hymns, sung, prayers, prayed, and the word considered. Our time in worship for today draws to a close. Thank you indeed for choosing to spend part of your day with us. I hope it was as nourishment to your soul. This day marks the last that I will be with you for five weeks. I am taking the month of July as holiday, and so in my absence, some very fine folk are stepping up. Uh, the first three Sundays in July will be uh, provided for by someone who is no stranger to our community, uh, the Reverend Phil Hobbs, uh, formerly your transitional minister and uh, for a year minister of pastoral care, pro tem, uh, is returning to offer the word and uh, be about prayer with you all. And for the last two Sundays in the month, we will uh, be blessed by the uh, coordinated efforts and participation of select members of our worship team and uh, indeed beyond. And when I say worship, it really should be worship and music team. Uh, so you can look forward to those occasions when together you will worship God. I will, of course, uh, make some introductions uh, during uh, that month in, in our worship services, but save and accept for that. 
uh, I will be uh, on vacation, as I suggested. Um, and for those who don't know, part of my time will be spent uh, in building my new house. Uh, I've uh, purchased some land uh, north of Coburg and uh, have uh, retained all manner of professionals to, to help get me to the point where uh, shovels are going in the ground uh, sometime uh, this upcoming week, I hope. Uh, and from there, it's just one step forward uh, in front of the other. So uh, do wish me luck. And uh, I will think of you uh, as I'm about that and as I'm about spending some time uh, refreshing my spirit so that in turn I can come and support you in your spiritual journey. Until that time when our paths cross again, go with God and with this blessing. May the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. May your home echo with the sound of laughter and love, and may you be held in the palm of God's hand, safe and secure, until our paths cross again, be it on this side or in heaven. God bless each one of you, and God bless us all. Amen. <laughs> This is a song you need to tell a bit of a story about. Oh, that's true. 1984, the four of us um, went to uh, be the music resource team at the conference of Northwestern, no, Manitoba and Northwestern Ontario that was held in Melita, the United Church uh, annual conference meeting. And it was a really exciting time because we got to go on the Killarney. That was a, a CPR rail car that... Uh, Ian uh, coaxed out of the vice president of CP, got put on the end of a coal train and hauled us down to, to Melita. It was, uh, it, I mean, this was really a, a neat car because it was Princess Anne that slept on it before us. Some years before us, but it didn't matter. I slept in her bed, I'm sure. She wasn't there, you understand. So, however, anyways, so... Uh, we went down to Melita. It was the most wonderful time of community together in uh, in this train car, and that's where we stayed through the week. And we go and play music and come back, and and we had a steward who fed us wonderfully. It was a strange, amazing time. He is actually introducing a song, by the way. <laughs> oh, great! <right. laughs> oh, we've only got time for twelve more songs now. I guess that's right. Anyways, um, we got there, and at one point, we were asked to sing a song called "We Are." A gentle, angry people. I'd never, not heard it before, I didn't think anyways. And we started practicing it, and we practiced it, and we got to a verse that I just stopped and thought, I can't sing this. I can't sing something I don't believe. So after the practice, I said to, uh, to the fellows, I said, I just, I can't join you in this song. And it was really, uh, it was really difficult to say that, and I'm sure it was more difficult to hear it. The verse that was uh, part of the song was, we are gay and straight together. And in 1984, I couldn't sing that. And um, as I said on Friday at a workshop, two things happened. One was, um, I didn't sing it. I, I played along with the song and sang all the other verses, which I did believe. And uh, for that one, I just hung my head and didn't uh, sing. And I felt so amazingly alienated. And it was all because of myself. I was the one doing the alienating at that point. And I was becoming aware of that, but at the same time I thought I was right. And, uh, oh, thinking you're right can do such awful things. And, um, and the other thing that happened was, was grace. Because nobody, nobody um, turfed me out. Nobody said, if that's how you are, we can't really kind of work together. Nobody did anything that um, did anything but welcome me in. And uh, I found that just as hard as, as uh, my own uh, inability to, um, to sing. Over the years, uh, as I began to look at Scripture harder, because that was the moment that made me face the question in myself and my, my thoughts and my feelings, my beliefs, over the years I came to realize that I was wrong. Ten years later, I wrote a song. I was in a job at the time that uh, you couldn't have a public opinion 
officially because uh, I was working for somebody else who um, spoke for the church and, um, and one had to take some care. So civil servants know what that's about and that's what I was, a bureaucrat in the life of the church in a wonderful position. But I wrote a song that uh, came out of an experience that just of learning something about inclusion and it's called Draw the Circle Wide, it's in your books. And although I couldn't say anything about it, this was a song for me of saying, yes, gay and straight together, and a whole lot of other folk together. And it got into the New Anglican Hymn Book, and nobody knew that's what it was about. (laughs) Until tonight. But now you do. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle wide. Got the still point of the circle, round whom all creation turns. Nothing lost but held forever. God's gracious heart. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by side. Draw the circle wide. Let our hearts touch far horizons, so encompass great and small, let our loving know no borders, faithful to God's call. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still, let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by side, draw the circle wide. Dreams we dream be larger than we've ever dreamed before. Let the dream of Christ be in us, open every door. Draw the circle wide, draw it wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, standing side by circle wide, draw the circle 